series, Life Hacks in the Book of James, and uh, I've been enjoying it. I don't know about you, but we're in week three, and, and uh, maybe you're like, oh, this is only week three, good grief, this is going to be forever. Um, it's going to be eight weeks, and, and I just, I think it's so practical, because the Book of James is so good, and, and, and if you've never gone through like a study in the Book of James or, or anything like it, I think when you find, it, and this is what is, is really good about it, is eventually you come to those places in Scripture where they challenge you, um, where they... Um, they make you uncomfortable. And if you're not to that place yet, today's going to be that day. I'm just telling you. I've talked to somebody this last week and they said, hey, preacher, every time you speak, I feel like you're speaking directly to me. And I was like, I don't, I'm not, but um, that may be God doing that. But, hey, it's a good thing um, because what God wants, what James is writing in his book, he's wanting us to change a little bit. And uh, if you're just sitting here like, eh, whatever, I just got to sit through this, hey, get some life changes in your life. Uh, there's, some, there's some great practical things that James has given us, and that's what we're trying to leave you with, um, and today's no exception. Um, I do have to start off, though, on the subject today, and, and we're going to get into it, and it's going to be a little bit of an intro, um, but I'm going to say something to make sure we're clear about this in the book of James. Your obedience to God, um, your obedience to God doesn't change the way God loves you. God doesn't love you anymore if you obey him or not. He loves you as much as he can. And I think for most of us, um, I was thinking about this to make sure I cover everybody in here so we all have some kind of common situation. Everybody in here is either been a parent, is a parent, been a parent, or had a parent, right? Okay, somebody says they didn't have a parent. Okay, we're going to have to talk. But um, one of those three things, so we can all relate to this. But here's what I know about kids from raising my own. Sometimes we put too much on their obedience to us and we make that the point of our love for them. And that's not the way God does it. In fact, if it, let me just help some of those young parents that are here today. Um, don't ever equate how your child acts with how much you love them. Because that will always be a problem down the road. Love them no matter what, unconditionally. Love them. And then maybe they'll act in a surprising way for you. And that's a good thing there. And that's the whole idea. See, what I knew about my kids is... My kids knew that they didn't get love from mom and dad because they did, they performed well, they did something a certain way. But sometimes, and this is the great point, sometimes my kids just did things I loved. And when you get to that point where you understand that, that's what God's trying to get us to. God's not asking you to perform so he loves you more, but to sometimes you do things in God's eyes that he just loves. And that's what James is trying to help us see throughout his writings here. He wants us to be that. Because your obedience doesn't get God's love, right? And I think we got that. But your obedience is evidence that love, God's love has gotten you. And that's what we want to really stress in this series. And we're going through these life hacks, which are just easy things that uh, help us. They're techniques. They're um, easy tools that help our lives be better spiritually. And that's what we're talking about. That's what James is talking about. And uh, James, as he's presenting this whole issue about wisdom, he talks about the fact that our faith um, shows up in our obedience to God by the way that we treat other people. And this is where it's going to get challenging today. Our faith shows up, the way that we act towards other people is the way God sees our faith. And that sometimes is scary because we don't actually treat other people well all the time. And that's what James is trying to do. See... James is saying how we treat people is the primary context that our faith shows up. Did you get that? Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said uh, your love for one another will be the marking aspect of being a disciple, a follower of me. 
And that's what James is trying to reinforce through this. And, and with that said, I want to give us, to start off today, I want to give us a visual metaphor that's going to be the key to this message, but I need some help. So if I can get five volunteers, come on, don't make me beg, don't make me call your name. Five people, just any five, five people, come on, I need you up here. <laughs> five, five, just five people. I got four, need one more, come on, somebody don't be stubborn. It, you don't have to say anything, you just have to stand here. Five people, I got five, I got six now, <laughs> I got four. Nope, come on, Donnie, you're up here. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want, good, okay? I want you to stand, and I want you to face the wall. All right, you can step right up there, step right up here. Appreciate it. Thank you. If I don't say thank you, I, I would say it now. A line, and, and they're just going to have to stand here for a minute or two. You know, uh, the visual metaphor of how we treat other people is this right here. It's a line, and I want you to think about this, because this is true. Heather could teach us a lesson on this one as a school teacher. I promise you this. You have been programmed since the day you came to school as a kindergartner to do this. In fact, good old Zach here, he's in the sad spot, isn't he? Right? Okay. The person at the back of the line is always what? <laughs> there it is. The <laughs> You're right. Why? Okay, he's the trouble. Ben said it right. He's the trouble man. Now, Zach's not. I like Zach here. But we don't want to be where Zach's at, especially in our lives. And, and be honest with you, the person who's in the good spot here is Crystal. Crystal's the line leader. And, and from the very moment that your teacher brought you in, and I don't know if they still do this. I imagine they still do this. But they assigned somebody to be line leader. Line leader. And it's a great responsibility and everybody wants to be the line leader, at least in elementary school, okay? I, I, and you can talk to Heather whether that still works or not. But I'm just telling you right now, when you see two kids fighting, when you were in elementary school and you saw two boys fighting at the front of the line, the teacher always said, hey, cut it out, go to the back of the line. Go to the back of the line. And so here we are in the back of the line. And, you know, here's the problem. This visual metaphor, we understand this. This visual metaphor we have right here, it's how we work in our lines and our uh, lines in our minds too because every time you see somebody no matter where you're at no matter what you do in life this is how you've been programmed you've been programmed to do this and you take the people that you run into people you don't even know people at walmart people at uh, whatever grocery store you go to whatever wherever you're at at the movie theater in the cars as you're driving past them and you know what you do in your mind you put them in a line and what do we do in our line the people that we think are more, more important, worth more, we put them up here. Right, Donnie? Right, that's a fact. That's right. <laughs> Donnie, I like that one. And unfortunately, the people we don't think much of, that we may not like, may not, and we don't even know them sometimes, you know what we do? We put them back here. And that's how we rate everybody. That's how we rate people that come to church. That's how we rate people we've never met before. That's how we rate people as we see them walking down the street. That's how we see everybody in our mind. And we put them in this line. And this line is that line in our mind. And the people with more, more coolness, more money, more character, more of what we want, we put at the front of our minds line. And the people that have somewhat less, they're more needy, they need more of us. We put them at the back of our line. They're the people that don't. And, and here's what we know about lines. As we sit here in this line, and they're getting a little uncomfortable. I won't keep you up here too much longer. But here's what we know about lines, right? Lines are good as long as we're all facing the right direction. But if I do this, it gets a little weird, doesn't it? <laughs> right? Just doesn't it get a little weird? <laughs> because if you've ever been to Disney World... The person who's doing what I'm doing right here irritates us, doesn't it? Because what happens is when the line moves forward and I'm facing the back of the line, all these people back here are like, move. Why did you not do this? And we look at the back of the line and people are going, that's wrong. It makes it uncomfortable. It makes it awkward. It makes it we're not doing because we've been programmed and our life's objective is what? In the line of our lives, we're just trying to get Right here. Isn't that what we've been taught? This is everything in life. In fact, this is the American dream. This is what we're celebrating on Tuesday. We're not really celebrating independence. We're celebrating a way of life that says get to the front of the line. 
And you say, well, that's not very American. I'm just saying, this is what we're celebrating now. It used to be we celebrated independence. Now we just celebrate greed, opulence. And we want the front of the line. And that was okay until this guy named Jesus comes along. And in Jesus' day, they did the same thing. They did this line. The Pharisees, the religious people, their, their, their line was like this. They put the religious people up front and said, hey, you know what? I'm a scribe. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Sadducee. I'm a religious person. I keep all the rules, so I ought to be in the front. Meanwhile, at the back, you had Zacchaeus. You had the woman at the well. You had the people that weren't thought highly, Matthew, Levi, and his friends. They were tax collectors. And Jesus comes along, and Jesus right away, man, just because he was Jesus, he fit in towards the front of the line, and so he's there, and he calls his disciples, but Jesus' problem is he's doing the awkward thing. He's looking at the back of the line the whole time, which irritated the people in front of him. And Jesus called his disciples to be with him, and they thought, "Woo! we got a free pass to the front of the line. And yet, when they got there to where Jesus was, they couldn't find him because Jesus went to the back of the line. And he was hanging out with Zacchaeus. And that, that didn't sit well with anybody right, but it sat in the mind of a guy named James, his younger brother, a guy who saw Jesus for the right, right spot. And he heard Jesus say things like, hey, you know what? The people in the kingdom of God, the last will actually be first. And the first, they're actually going to be last. And it made such an impression that James comes and he, he sort of writes about this. And, and I think what, what happens is James has the same thought that I had when I thought about this line. Is so often I mess up in the line because I'm self-absorbed, because I'm thinking about how I can get to the front of the line, how I can be first in everything, how I can be that person. And when I'm self-absorbed, it's usually because I'm facing forward, just trying to get ahead. And that's the issue. Thank you, thank you guys. I appreciate you. Help me illustrate this out, and I hope you got the point. Last week, last week we left off in James chapter 1, verse 27. This is week we're going to start there. James chapter 1, verse 27. Think of this in the context of what we just talked about as our introduction. In James chapter 1, verse 27, James says this. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. And, and just, just to make sure you understand what he's saying. The faith that God is looking for. Okay? That's what he's saying here. The faith that God is pleased with. The faith that is honoring to him, what, is, what God's looking for, what he's searching for in a person, religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after, and I'm going to get back to that phrase in just a second, but to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by this world. And he says that because he wants us to understand that the faith that God is looking for, the faith that God's searching for, the faith that pleases God is when you care most for the people who are in the most need the people who need the most help, when, you're sacrificial, uh, when you give sacrificial care to those who are helpless, the widows, the orphans, to look after. That was the key phrase he said there in the first part of that verse, to look after. It means to seek out, to go visit, or to go out of the way to give your help to those who are most vulnerable. That's what he's saying. You know what he's really saying here? And let me help you out in modern translation. He's saying go to the back of the line. Go to the back of the line. And yet we've been taught the exact opposite. It's countercultural, and that's what James is saying here. He said, you want what God wants? Go to the back of the line. And then he ties us in with the subject of favoritism. As he, and remember, as he writes this, there were no numbers. There were no chapter divisions. It was just one long letter. So he goes in chapter 2, in verse number 1, he says this. My brothers and sisters. <laughs> Make sure we understand who he's talking to. My brothers and sisters. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show, what's that word? Favoritism. favoritism. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Hey, what he's saying here is remember. Remember that Jesus Christ, who was my older brother, but remember he's also the one who came and he suffered and he died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb and that three days later he rose again. Remember him. Remember, he's the same God that doesn't make lines. In fact, he's the same God that went to the back of the line for you and for me. Remember him because as his followers, don't show favoritism. And you say, well, that's easy. I don't do that. You would think, but that's not necessarily true. See, here's the issue. 
James, he's tying this, this, this issue in. In fact, he goes over and over again about God is not showing favorite. And this is a subject that really is something that is so important. The Bible, from the very beginning to the very end, covers this over and over again. Let me, let me give you a few verses just to prove my point. Deuteronomy, in chapter number <clears throat> 10, verse number 17, the Bible says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. That sounds pretty amazing. Who shows no partiality, shows no partiality. There's no favorites with God and accepts no bribes. Over in the book of uh, 2 Chronicles, in chapter 19, verse number 7, it says, for, the, uh, for with the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. Over in the New Testament, Romans chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For God does not show favoritism. And that seems to be a problem because we often do, and that's what James is dealing with here. Psychologists, um, just for a basis of understanding what we're dealing with here, psychologists say that favoritism comes in two different forms. Uh, there is conscious bias and unconscious bias. And I want, I want to describe both of them real quick. Conscious bias, and these words may seem like huge words, but they're pretty easy to understand. Conscious bias is defined, and let me give you the textbook definition which doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is undistinguished volitional discrimination against somebody or a group of people. Here's what I would say. It's obvious. Conscious bias is obvious. It, it's willful. It's when, I, it's when somebody says, I willfully, consciously hate you because of the color of your skin, because of your political affiliation, because of your social status, because of your economic status, because of your lifestyle. I hate you. Whew, that's pretty tough. That's conscious bias. Have we seen that in today's world? All over the place. Turn on the news anytime, any day. And, and you know what? We think it's, it's not here in the church, but it is because we hate back. We get angry at people who don't agree with us politically. We get angry who don't, don't agree with us economically. We get, we get angry about everything. And we treat people just the same way. In fact, if they have a sinful lifestyle, we sort of get angry about that too. And we say things like, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. But we really mean God hates, and God hates just the way I hate. And that's the way we do it, because we put them in the line. Because those people, those people who have lifestyles that are opposite of ours, opposite of what we believe, you know what we think? That they ought to be back here. And we're just like the Pharisees, and we put ourselves up here in the front of the line and say, you know what? Somebody needs to go to the back of the line and save those people. And that's what James is talking about. That's conscious. But the other one is, is unconscious bias. And, and unconscious bias is more subtle. Um, this is preferences that we aren't even aware we have. Um, for instance, Malcolm Gladwell, famous writer, uh, brilliant mind, he wrote a book called Blink. And in this book, he did a study on this, this um, unconscious bias. And he said this. Um, this is what he, and it's amazing when I came across this. Um, he did a study of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and what they had in common, because he's trying to find out what makes them be CEOs of Fortune 500 countries, companies. And here's what he found. The U.S. average, the U.S. average for men that are six feet and taller. How many of you guys in here are six foot or taller? Okay. The U.S. average is only 14.5% of men are six foot or taller. So if you're under the six foot, don't feel bad. You're actually more in tune with the national average. Okay? The rest of us that are six feet or taller, but did you know this? That in Fortune 500 companies, the men CEOs, 58%, more than half of them, 58% of all Fortune 500 com company CEOs are over six foot. When the national average is only 14.5%. Hmm. In fact, let's go one step further. How many of you guys are 6'2 or taller? Okay, not as many hands. Mine's still up. 6'2 or taller. The national average for men 6'2 or, or taller, 3.9%. Now we're getting into a really small group. 3.9% of people 6'2 or taller. Okay, we're in the, the awful weird. But in Fortune 500 companies... Over one third of all Fortune 500 company CEOs were six foot two or taller. Now, do I believe that when the board of directors sits down and interviews somebody to be their CEO, they go through and go, hey, graduate from Harvard, Harvard, multimillionaire, done this, done this, done this, oh, five foot eight, throw him out the door? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. They don't do that. But somewhere in their thinking, somewhere it's skewed that they believe that better CEOs are taller. 
That may not be true, but it is factually proven. There are some other studies that he did, and I won't bore you with all those. But when we get to this, you say, why is that important? Well, here's what I want you to see. James, as he's writing this, he may have not had all those psychologist definitions and things like that, but he had the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit was trying to get us to understand? That we may not think we play favorites. We may not think we have shown favoritism to people, but it's a problem because James wrote about it. It's a problem that God's Holy Spirit's leading James to write about, and that's the very subject he's talking about it. And James wants us to see that bias in our lives is present. So he goes on, and he says this in verses 2 through 4. He says this in verse 2. He says, suppose, and that means he's going to give you a little hypothetical situation, a little story to illustrate what he's talking about. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. Now, you sit back and you, you think, well, that's crazy, that's strange, but that happens. In fact, that happened more often than not in their day. They each actually in the first century during this time period had centers where you could actually rent gold rings. Rent gold rings for the day or for, for a certain amount of time. You could rent them because a gold ring elevated your social economic status and so did some of the fine clothes. Maybe it was a better toga or whatever they were wearing, but that was what they did, and what he's talking about is someone who's gone out of the way to make sure they're in a better state, better state economically. They want to look better. Contrast it with a guy who comes in, and he's got filthy, smelly, rotten clothes. That's the situation, and this is what James says. Verse 3, he says, if you show special attention, if you go out of your way, with special attention, I'm going to call it VIP treatment. If you show VIP treatment to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or, hey, sit on the floor by my feet. Okay, feet, feet were disgusting back then. They didn't have nice shoes like you're wearing. Everything was dirty and filthy. And he says, if you do that, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Wow. He's, he's helping us understand. See, here's what you ought to realize. If you're not aware of your unconscious bias, it can actually undermine your conscious beliefs. Did you get what I just said? If you're not aware of your unconscious bias, it can actually undermine your conscious beliefs. Here's the problem he's saying. To put it really simple for us, he says, if you say you love God, if you say you believe in Jesus Christ, and you say all these things, but you treat your wife wrong, your husband wrong, you treat your kids poorly, you treat your mailman, you treat your garbage man, you treat people that you don't even know, you treat them poorly, you know what? You play in favor. You've discriminated. You've done the wrong thing. And you may not even act like you know it, but you know what? They know it. And you've undermined your conscious beliefs. Because your conscious beliefs, nobody's going to believe that you love God when you don't treat them like Jesus would treat them. When you put yourself in the front of the line and you put them in the back of the line, nobody's going to believe you're a Christ follower. And that's what James is trying to help us understand. And here's the, here's the truth point for the day. You fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment. <laughs> and you grow in your character, too, to those more vulnerable than you. And that's what James wants to say. You fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment. And think about Jesus in this. I named some people. He gave VIP treatment to a guy named Zacchaeus, didn't he? Zacchaeus, come down and go to, I want to go to your house today. He didn't go to anybody else's house. He went to Zacchaeus' house. The one at the well, he sat there all in the middle of that hot day, he sat there all that time talking to her when nobody else would. He had a party at Matthew's house. And he didn't invite the, the, the religious people. Who did he invite? All of Matthew's friends. Jesus said, you know what? You fight favoritism by giving VIP treatment to those who are more vulnerable than you. But that's the opposite of the American way. See, We've been taught, even in our Christian circles, and, and, and I've heard people, even at this church, give me reason after reason why I wouldn't help those who are begging for food because they might try and scam me. <laughs> Doesn't go along with Jesus' thought, does it? Because Jesus says, you know what? If you spend more time at the back of the line than trying to make it to the front of the line, 
you're going to be more of one of my disciples, one of my followers. We fight favoritism by going to the back of the line. And he tells this story, and, and, and if we were going to put it in modern context, let me ask you this. Suppose today that two people drove up to our church. One person drove up in a Maserati or whatever car you think is really cool. Maybe it's a pickup truck, because I know we have a lot of guys who like pickup trucks. you got a pickup truck that's just all decked out. It's got everything you can imagine. It's bigger than anybody's. And you drive up, you see this guy drive up, and he gets out, and he's got a nice deep tan. He's got nice hair that flows everywhere. He's fit. I know. <laughs> he's not me. That's what I'm saying. He's fit, and he's sharp looking, and he comes in, and he's got his Armani or whatever clothes he's got on, and he looks sharp. And the same time, a guy pulls up in his Toyota Corolla that's rattling. The exhaust has got holes in it, and you can hear it coming down the road. In fact, you can see the trail of smoke from that nice Toyota. The color of the car is primer because he's trying to cover up all the rust. And he gets out, and he pulls the key out, but it still rattles a little bit afterwards. And he gets out, and his clothes are full of holes, and they smell. And he looks unshaven, unkept, sloppy. He's got a beard that's hanging down that's not cool because it's got food in it from three days ago. And they both walk in our door. And we have a packed house, except for there's one seat open next to you. What do you do? We'll come back to that. James goes on to say, in verse 5, he says, listen. <laughs> and I think that's so important because we don't do that very often. Listen. And he's, he's not yelling at us. He wants us to, to feel this. He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor? Did you get who chose them? God chose those who are poor in the eyes of of the world to be rich in faith. Because you know what? Rich people don't need God, so they don't want God. That was what Jesus taught. Remember when Jesus said, it's easier for a rich man, uh, for a camel to enter into the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? This is what he's saying here. This is James understanding what Jesus said. He said, God, God blessed those people to, in, in the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. In verse 6, beginning in verse 6, he says, but you have dishonored the poor. He's pointing a finger back, and he says, it's not so with the rich who are, is, is it not so with the rich who are exploiting you? And skip down a couple of verses. In verse 8, he says, if you really keep the royal law, that golden rule that we were taught, right? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love, and you make sure you understand what it is, love your neighbor as yourself, because he said that was one of two of the greatest commandments ever, right? The first one was love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The second one was love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you really keep the royal law as found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. <laughs> he's, he's, he's saying, you know what? You got the right idea. The line thing, it, it goes away. But if you show favoritism, if you would take that guy who came in in the beat-up car that's broken down and, and smelly clothes and food in his, in his beard and doesn't look nice and smells horrible and wouldn't let them sit next to you, you sin. He doesn't pull any punches here. He says, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Verse 10, he says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, just one little thing, is guilty of breaking it all. And then he finishes out in verse 12 and 13, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. <laughs> Notice what he's saying here. Your actions, remember James has been that doer of the word thing, not just to hear, not just sit back and say, amen, preacher, but actually go out of your way to do this thing, to show favor. You know what he's saying? Hey, speak and act just like Jesus, because Jesus was going back here to the back of the line, and he was hanging out with Zach. He was hanging out with that's Zacchaeus. He's hanging out with uh, Zach too, but um, Zacchaeus. Um, he's hanging out with the woman at the well. He's hanging out with all these people that nobody else would. He hung out with the lame. He hung out with the, the blind. He hung out with those that, hey, the Pharisees weren't coming out to see him. He says, speak and act like those who are going to be judged, because you will be. You're going to be judged by the same law that gives you freedom. See, that's what we miss in the world today. Because when we go around and say, hey, I'm a Christian. Are you a Christian? Did you pray a prayer? Did you do these things? And they're going, but you were out railing against Democrats. But you were out picking against this person. You were out calling this person a hate name. You were out hating on everybody. We didn't look the same way as you, and you didn't treat us with VIP treatment. How can you say that you love us? 
And he's saying that same law will judge you. In verse 13, he says, because judgment, judgment without mercy. Did you catch the key there? Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's what he's trying to get us to understand. We're supposed to be merciful. Mercy is love in action. Put your love in action is what he's saying. Mercy is giving VIP, VIP treatment. It's going to the back of that line. And at some point in your life, some point in your life, you're going to have to make a decision about how you're going to live. Are you going to live like your life like you're trying to impress other people? Or are you trying to live like you're trying to make an impact? That's the theological content of what James is saying here. So let's look at the life hacks. There are four life hacks I want to give you today. How do we live this out? How do we get it practical? And these four things, they're not going to, be, they're not going to blow your mind or anything, but these are four things. If we want to defeat the, the favoritism that's shown, the biases, conscious and unconscious bias, and we want to treat others with VIP treatment, here's how we do it. Number one, learn names. And yeah. If you think you're, God's speaking to you, he's speaking to me because this is the one I hate the most. Because you know what? Every day of my life up to this point, I've used, I'm just not good at remembering names. And I know some of you guys have done it too. And you know what that is? An excuse. An excuse. And remember what we said about excuses? They're like armpits, right? Everybody has two of them, at least two of them, and they all stink. That's the truth. We need to learn names. You know, <clears throat> to learn other people's names means you have to be focused on other people, and that's why we don't learn names real well. Uh, I think it was, um, oh, the name just went out of my mind. I didn't write it down. Famous guy, I, I, I'd have to look it up for you. Famous guy, I'm just going to say that. He said, you know what the sweetest name is? The sweetest name you ever hear is yours. And that's not wrong. He wasn't saying it in a theological context. What he's saying is we are more important to us by our names. In fact, it's so amazing. You can be in a crowd and somebody says your name, not even speaking to you, but they say your name. You All of a sudden, you hear that above everything else, and you stop. And that's the truth. See, when you focus on learning someone's name, it's a powerful thing. I heard this story about this uh, group of uh, Christians down in Georgia. These men got together. <clears throat> they weren't anything special. They were just average Joe guys, and they decided they wanted to do something, and they took the Bible pretty literally. There's a passage in, uh, that Jesus uses and he talks about, giving, we always focus on giving a cup of water in his name. It also talks about going and visiting people in prison. And so they decided they would do that. In fact, this group of guys, they got together and said, you know what would be cool? If we interacted with the prisoners in this, this prison by going in and playing basketball with them. So once a month, they made a, an appointment, they got clearance to do this, and they would go in and they would actually play basketball with the guys in this prison. And I sat back and I thought, why would anybody want to do that? I mean, that scares me a little bit. You never know. Some of those guys, you know, there might be a shiv or something. I watch too many movies. And the guy, the guy, as he was telling the story, he said, the reason they did this and they played is because they had to get interactive with these men so they would learn their names. Because in prison, you don't have a name. You have a number. You have a cell number. You have an inmate number. And you lose your individuality there. And it's the worst kind of treatment you can ever imagine being put in prison. I've never been put in prison. Maybe you have. But learning their names shows a sign of respect and gives them just an hour or two in a month of someone actually valuing them to the point where they learn my name. And it's changed the outlook. And these are some of the happiest inmates they've ever met, even though they're serving heavy-duty sentences. I thought it was amazing. Number two, the second thing is not just learn names, but listen to stories. Listen to stories. <laughs> There's a guy, um, there's a guy who, he, he was renowned for listening to people's stories. And, and you think about what James said. James told us to listen. And that's something that I think we do poorly. But this guy, he, uh, he was renowned. In fact, he made national headlines, and I won't get into his. I started to pull a video up for him, but I knew we were going to be a long time, and I didn't want to be a long time uh, more than we need to. But this guy, when he meets somebody, he always looks at them, and he has this good way of speaking to them, and he says, Hey, you know what? I'm in, the, I'm in the business of collecting stories. Tell me yours. And he sits down and doesn't say anything more. And he said, people have opened up to him. And he's heard some of the most incredible stories ever. Because he's willing to listen to stories. And I think so often we get in the business of life that we don't take the time to listen to Zacchaeus' story or the woman at the well story. Think about what Jesus did. This is biblical. You say, oh, this is crazy stuff. No, Jesus listened to stories because people mattered. And if we're going to give VIP treatment to the people who are at the back of our lines, 
We need to start learning their names and listening to stories. Number three, share possessions. Share possessions. <laughs> this one goes even farther. I, I think when we start learning how to share what God has given to us, and that's where we become greedy as Americans. What's mine is mine, and you can't have it, is what we say most often. But God says, hey, share. In fact, that's what the church in Acts did. <laughs> guy was telling the story. Um, this preacher was telling the story. He was a guy, I, I can relate to this guy, because um, he wasn't a very good golfer, but he liked golf, and, and that's how I am. I'm not a very good golfer. I like to golf. <sighs> but uh, his, his dad took him one time to a golf course to play golf. And it wasn't just any golf course. It was Augusta National. Now, if you're a golfer, you know right away. That's, that's the mecca of all golf courses, um, it, it, at least here in the U.S. Um, he took him there, and uh, it was amazing. He said it was so scary because here he is playing, and he's not a good golfer at all. He said they are playing, and uh, you had to have a caddy. He said, I've never played in a golf situation where you have to walk the whole course, and you had somebody carrying your stuff for you. You had a caddy helping you. And he said, he, he said it was embarrassing because he's that bad of a golfer. I can relate to that. He's, he does army golf. If you don't know what army golf is, it's left, right, left, right. Okay? Um, and you'll get it if you ever talk to somebody who golfs. Um, they can explain that. But he said he wasn't so excited about that. But the one thing he knew he could look forward to was at the turn, the clubhouse. He said they had already selected their lunch, and he was excited about lunch because the clubhouse had really good lunch. He said they had these famous sandwiches there at the, the clubhouse that, that he had heard so much about, and so it would be waiting for him. So they got the first nine holes done. They came to the turn. They're sitting there. They went inside the air conditioning, sat down, and their food was being brought to them. They had these huge plates with these big sandwiches brought to them, and they're in the nice air conditioning, and he said his, he looked up, and his dad his dad was turned around looking out the window where he saw all the caddies, and all the caddies were sitting along the curb line, just sitting there. And his dad stopped, because his dad had never been there before either, and his dad said, hey, asked the guy who was serving, he said, hey, uh, do the caddies get lunch? Because they've been working pretty hard. The guy said, no, they, don't. they get a packet of crackers and a Coke. He said, uh, the, man, the man just sat there, and he, he said, I was getting ready to to get into my sandwich, and he said, I looked over, my dad had taken out his knife. He didn't say anything, he just took out his knife, and he reached down, and he cut his sandwich in half. Stood up, didn't say a word to his son or anything, stood up with his plate, and walked out there, and sat down next to his caddy, and handed his caddy half his lunch. He said, I was so upset, because I looked forward to that sandwich. I wasn't looking forward, because I wasn't golfing really well at all. I'd lost more golf balls than I'd played he said, I was doing horrible, but I was looking forward to this lunch because that was the only thing really I could save my day on. And he said, I felt my dad, without saying a word, my dad had sort of convicted me. And he said, I got up. He said, I cut my sandwich in half. I got up. And I went out and sat down next to mine. He said, everybody in our group did the same thing. Every one of them. He said, there are two things uh, that this lesson taught me. And I, and I thought these were good. He said, first of all, there's a big difference between giving and sharing. There is. There's a big difference between giving and sharing. Hey, you know what? We don't have a problem giving something we're not going to use. Hey, you can have it. I don't need it. But sharing, sharing usually is something that we have that's worth something to us. I think the second lesson he, he, he learned was just as important. He said this, mercy, mercy I learned that day is contagious. And what amazing thing is, we did that kindness initiative last year the reason we did that is because I want to get kindness to be something that's contagious in our life. I want to be known as a church that's kind, that does things for people without expecting anything in return. I want to be known as people who go to the back of the line because that's what Jesus was known for. Fourth, last of all, we need to provide opportunities. Provide opportunities. I, th I think this is so amazing. Uh, I was thinking back, um, and I don't know if you've ever gotten to this point in your life, when somebody treated you to the point where they were giving you VIP treatment because they provided opportunities that you'd never have. Um, I've never said it. I don't want to embarrass him either, but I'm going to say something this morning. Charles, my dad didn't grow up where he was around me much because he worked CIA. He was out of the country a lot. He was just traveling. So I didn't learn how to hunt. I didn't learn how to hunt. I didn't learn how to fish. Charles took me out. One of the first years I was here before COVID shut us down. I, I, and I said thank you, but I want to publicly say I appreciate that, Charles. It wasn't a, to me, it probably wasn't a big thing to him, but it was. He took me out and you know, watched me fall down, and he watched me be a dumb city guy and all that kind of stuff. I appreciate that. 
And, and it, it's something my dad didn't do. And a lot of you guys, you take it for granted. You know how to hunt. You know how to shoot. And you do all those things. I didn't have a dad that did that. Now, I had a dad that did great things. So I'm not underprivileged. But I appreciate it. He provided me with an opportunity that I'd never had in my life. Things that I never got to do. There are some of you that do that. I know Seth took out some boys last weekend to go out four-wheel riding and things like that. I appreciate guys like that. And we all have these opportunities. If we're not going to be selfish and looking towards the front of the line trying to get ahead, we would be able to provide more opportunities to the people at the back of the line who have no opportunities. And that's how we defeat favoritism. So as we finish out today, I have two questions I want you to consider. First of all, as we've talked today, in your own heart, has God revealed any favoritism to you? If so, don't ignore it. Don't just sit there and go, yeah, yeah, I need to deal with this. You know what I want you to do? I want you to repent of it. And repentance means you need to change. You need to stop what you're doing and go the opposite direction. Question number one. Question number two, where would God call you to go to the back of the line? If you would just take that one question, write it down this week, and ask yourself every day, every moment, not forget it. You can walk out of here and go, yeah, 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 and just be the same person you've always been trying to get ahead. But where would God call you to go to the back of the line, to serve? God came. Jesus said, I came not to serve, or not to be served, but to serve. And that's why he died on the cross. He said, I love you this much. And he held his hands out on that cross. The question I have for you today is, do you know Jesus Christ, your Savior? If you do, hey, where are you at? God doesn't have lines. He's headed to the back. He's spending his time with VIP treatment for those who need it the most. Where are you? Where does God call you to go back to the back of the line? If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior today, it's the greatest choice you can make. I, I would urge you. Hey, please, see me, see Tracy, see somebody today. Hey, we're going to have an invitation. Don't be afraid. It's the best decision you can ever make. It's the most important decision. If you don't know Jesus Christ, hey, none of this really mattered until you get to know Jesus. That's when it changes. In just a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation. We're going to sing. You don't have to sing. What do I want you to do? Hey, there's some people in here. We need to pray. We need to ask God's forgiveness. We need to repent because we've been favoritism. Hey, you know what? I've seen some of your Facebook posts where you've hated people who are not the same political views as you. You've hated people who are not the same lifestyle views as you. You've hated people. We've got to stop doing that. We've got to start being like Jesus. We need to go to the back of the line. Go to the women at the well. Go to the Zacchaeuses. Go to the Levi's. Go to the different people, the, the people who are blind like Bartimaeus, the people who have nothing. What are you going to do?